I love the energy in the room right now. You can hear the, uh, the buzz of a great couple of days. It is, uh, it is always great to come to the end of a weekend and still feel like everybody is energized, and I can certainly hear that. So um, before I introduce uh, Will, and I will uh, keep it short this time, one thing I will ask is that everyone stay in their seats after his closing remarks, because we do have a couple of logistics to take care of, including a survey on the whole weekend. The results of that survey are super important to us, so we're gonna actually ask, if you would, that you would do it right from your seats so we can make sure we collect that data before everybody goes home uh, and we forget. We've got some, uh, some thank yous, of course, to come and a few follow-up logistics, um, including an after party uh, tonight as well. So you wanna make sure that you get the details on that. So before we get there, though, to close EA Global Boston 2017, please welcome back your favorite moral philosopher and mine, <laughs> Will McCaskill. When you said that, I was literally looking around for Peter Singer, but very, <laughs> very disappointing. Um, no, thank you. I mean, thanks for everyone for making it through this weekend and still coming here. Um, before I begin, I also want to thank Amy for running such an amazing conference, Julia for being so involved, Nathan Roxanne for emceeing, all of the volunteers in blue and all the speakers, and then all of you for actually turning up as well. So um, yeah, thank you, thank you, Amy. So I've had a really tremendous time over the last couple of days. It's been action-packed from my perspective. It's been so nice to have so many people coming up with idea to me with like really pretty, some pretty exciting ideas for the EA Grants program. Um, I mean, the highlights for me are kind of too many to name, but some include, I mean, I loved Kevin Esvelt's talk. I've been thinking a lot recently about, you know, when super intelligence going to come. And after meeting him, I realized it's already here. So um, he's like a pretty intimidating guy, but very nice with it. Um, I also just loved people coming out of the fold who'd kind of been doing EA stuff and hadn't really ever thought about it, where um, you know, one example for me was Aaron Hamlin from the Center for Electoral um, Science, um, you know, making the case to me for thinking about voting reform and improving voting systems um, on EA grounds and thinking through this um, actually making like a kind of a pretty good case. Um, but then, but in particular, thinking about this question from the EA lens, like actually how big could this be if we were um, successful in improving voting systems? It might be, you know, hard, very politically difficult to do this, but, you know, there's some chance. I'm really trying to think about the long-term costs and benefits of this. Um, I was also really excited to hear from Holly Elmore um, about the goings-on of EA Harvard, and in particular that they're launching a, um, Harvard EA podcast as well, where the whole first season is just dedicated to getting um, public figures on board to do ideological Turing tests and um, talk about why their own view is completely rubbish. So I'm really excited um, to see how well the kind of distinguished luminaries like Larry Summers and Steven Pinker do um, at that. Um, I think it'll be a good way to assess like how seriously do they hold their views. Um, so this talk, though, I'm going to talk just a little bit about um, ways in which EA as a kind of community needs to adapt. In particular, EA has been growing a lot. I mentioned that at the very start. Um, and that really changes the message, I think, for what um, we ought to do as EAs. So lots of the kind of core ideas that were coming out from uh, effective altruism researchers and thinkers were based on this question, what ought I to do? So what career ought I to pursue? What charity ought I to give to? Whereas now, it's not just um, a few weirdos in a room um, trying to think about how they can do the most good themselves. It's, instead, it's this community of thousands of people around the world. Um, and that really means the key question becomes not just what can I do as an individual, but what can we do as part of this community? Because often that's very different. Um, once you've got a much larger community, often the things that's best for individuals to do um, can be very different. Um, and so I'm going to go through some of these ways that I think things are changing. Um, so this kind of overview, externalities, positive and negative, are going to become larger. 
means it's harder because there's less in-person interaction. It's going to have more engagement with other groups, but also greater resilience and momentum. So I'll go through each one. So externalities, um, anytime you do something, there's normally the kind of direct thing that you're attempting to do, but then side effects, positive and negative. Um, when it's just an individual, then you might not think that these are very important, but now the larger and larger the community, if you do a certain action that then has impacts on the rest of the community, positive or negative, as the size of the community gets larger, the importance of these get larger again. Uh, so one of these um, that's really important, I think, is like value of information and exploration, where if you're just figuring out like what career should I pursue, and it's just thinking about yourself in the abstract, in isolation, the fact that you will learn about a specific area, even if it turns out not to be the best thing, like that's not that valuable. You know, you learn something, but other people don't get the same benefit. But if there's now, you know, hundreds of other people who might be considering this path, that can actually be really valuable. So you can do something and maybe it's a huge success, maybe it's a total disaster. But either way, actually, that can be a really big benefit because everyone in the community learns about that. And that's something for those who are at Amanda's talk, um, she talked about a lot more, but it's becoming um, progressively more important for the EA community. And then similarly, new ideas, um, very similar structure, but perhaps that's not through you exploring, but doing actual research into, um, for example, a new cause area. That's now not just going to affect potentially one person or a small number of people's donations, but a very large amount of money being moved and um, uh, time being allocated. And similarly, if you just go out and do really cool, impressive things, that's going to reflect very positively on the rest of the kind of EA community and make that community even stronger. Um, so, you know, if you do set up a nonprofit or a for-profit organization and it just achieves something great, it, like, is a visible demonstration of the kind of power of these ideas. Um, and so one example in this, in my mind, is the company Wave, which is a very successful um, for-profit uh, company with an altruistic mission. Many employees are here of um, doing mobile money in developing countries. And it's just doing what seems to me like huge positive impact for the world and set up in part by people who had these kind of altruistic aims. It just shows like, yeah, if we do um, think very strategically about how to do the most good, you can end up just having like massive positive impacts in the world. And that like provides a kind of argument for some of these ideas by demonstration. Obviously, there's net, like, you know, possible negative externalities as well, so reputational costs. Um, so, you know, you might be considering like writing a controversial article or something, and um, it's kind of provocative and will get a lot of attention. Um, uh, but, you know, that'll be very divisive. Now, if it's the case that these ideas were getting very little traction, um, as they were in like, you know, even just 10 years ago or kind of before then, maybe that trade-off is kind of worth it. You might alienate some number of people, but um, it's going to be worth it to reach a kind of message to a much larger number. Um, now, though, I think that's just not really going to be the case. Instead, um, doing things that aren't going to be divisive or potentially alienating, um, unless they kind of, you know, it's really an important idea that just has to be said, is going to be like, it's going to be the case that we want to be a lot more um, cautious about those sorts of things, because it's this larger community that's at stake. And similarly, in terms of like cultural effects within um, effective altruism as well, these are things where you know, now it's not just the case that like, someone, you know, if someone interacts with someone on Facebook previously, they might think, oh, that guy's you know, a jerk, if they're being a jerk. But now they'll think, oh, EAs are jerks which is tend to be like how people reason when it comes to these sorts of things, even if that's kind of unfair. And I think the second order of effects as well that we should be kind of thinking about at least, um, and in the course of laying this out, I'm gonna suggest like some things that I think are kind of upshots in, um, after this, but a lot of the time I think these are kind of issues that we just need to be thinking about as a community. So um, one is kind of second order of effects as well, which is just if people are worried now about kind of reputational costs, you might get less kind of conversations happening in public. And I think that could be bad in terms of um, risks of uh, slowing down kind of intellectual progress within effective altruism because people feel like they can talk 
not as freely. I mean, a second thing then is um, in terms of just got a bigger community, just not everyone can meet each other in person. Um, and that, you know, again, has challenges. So it's going to be less information transfer as quickly for core ideas and culture. Um, also, of course, a greater opportunity as a result of that for misunderstandings between people. Um, also, kind of bigger risk of getting in group, out group dynamics. But especially kind of weird as a community where you've got such different aims. You can have people worrying about the fate of kind of human civilization at the same time. Other people worrying about kind of farm animal welfare, other people worrying about extreme poverty. Got quite different aims, but many things in common. And we definitely want to really avoid ensuring that people feel like it's, we're splintering into kind of different groups. Um, I think it's also going to be the case that kind of larger that effective altruism grows, um, there's going to just be more interaction with um, external groups. Partly that's because you're larger, so there's more surface area. But also, it just means you're kind of being taken more seriously now. Um, again, it's no longer the case that if you're talking to, like, the Gates Foundation or something, you're not just this one weird person <laughs> um, with some ideas that no one's taking seriously. Instead, it's like representing something much larger. And that can be really good um, because, you know, potentially you've got more opportunity for these ideas to take hold because they're coming along with this credibility. But it also, again, poses risks because you also, we also might be more likely to get attacked or seen as a threat, especially if we're taking resources, perhaps, from other cause, cause areas. Um, then the final kind of thread of things as we uh, grow larger is just that movement as a whole is going to have greater resilience and greater momentum. Um, and that, in general, I think, is just going to seem good because it, it can help us with kind of planning. So it means that we've got more leeway to do hits-based approaches. Again, if it's just one person, um, you're probably going to have to do something that's almost certainly going to be good in order to kind of prove the validity of a method. Whereas if you've got a large number of people trying out different things, then some of them are going to be hits, and some of them are going to be really big hits, um, if at least you've calculated the expected value right. Um, and so that's really exciting as well. It means we can move away from things that are necessarily sure bets and move to more um, speculative sorts of activities knowing that as a whole, we're probably going to have a big impact. Um, similarly, because we know we're going to, this is going to be continuing for quite a while, we can do activities with a longer-term payoff. Um, finally, as well, just in terms of thinking about career choice, definitely the people who first started off within kind of effective altruism, it was really, you know, you believe in the idea, and, but maybe, who knows, like, how's this going to look if it doesn't pan out? Um, you'll have just been working for some kind of unknown organization. Um, whereas that's not nearly as true now. I think you can go into EA and have a pretty good knowledge that it's still going to be around in um, 10 or 20 years. Um, and so the greater resilience and momentum is kind of very exciting. So that's kind of overview of some of the big changes, I think, that EA kind of makes to the growth of EA makes to how we think about various decisions. What does that mean in terms of what we can actually do? So, I think one thing is that, especially for career decisions, we had to start relying more on the kind of mindset than particular recommendations. Because it becomes particularly hard just to say, oh, everyone should be doing this thing. Because for reasons of value information, reasons of wanting to get diversity, it means we actually want to have a big spread of what people are doing. And that's obviously then hard to set, make generalizations about. But if you've got the core mindset, the idea of you know, being quantitative and trying to be as rational as possible and having this aim of trying to benefit others as much as possible, you can at least get much better sense of figuring out how your plans might fit into the wider ecosystem. And then relatedly with that is experimentation. So this whole conference was kind of about this. It was about new frontiers and effective altruism, addressing things that we haven't thought about um, in as much detail before. Um, and that, again, like I say, applies to career choice. If we don't, you know, I don't know of anyone in effective altruism who's doing anthropology, for example. And maybe you might not think that within kind of effective altruism, someone having a really good understanding of anthropology is um, the most important thing to do. But at some point, of the, some point of movement size, we'd want to have someone with knowledge of this area. Maybe it's going to uncover something that we've really not thought about. Um, 
on the kind of last second two, I think of reputational costs and being really considerate. Um, that's just just more than more. It's now that has to be the case that like when we're kind of engaging, we're doing so as um, kind of ambassadors of a certain idea, um, and that can be a shame. I mean, it's definitely in my own case. You know, you kind of get a bit of a loss of just being not being able to speak like as freely and just say, "Well, these are just my ideas. I'm just talking off the top of my head." Whereas naturally, people do start associating things with um, the ideas as a whole, whether or not that's kind of justified. Um, and similarly, in terms of like building a culture, and so far as people are going to just have less in-person interaction, it does mean that just thinking of our, you know, the whole of us as like one big in-group, um, thinking of um, being as like considerate and sympathetic to opposing views, um, being as sympathetic as possible to like opposing arguments is going to be super important. Um, then, in terms of the intellectual side of EA, um, I think one thing, yeah, again, that I'd love to see is more of the kind of core ideas um, getting written up in public ways, where a lot of the time, and you know, being at Oxford, surrounded by academics, this happens an awful lot. People uh, will have great ideas, and they'll just kind of never actually make it into writing. Um, and again, when you've got a small number of people, that can be fine, because you can just communicate it verbally. But that becomes less and less possible, the just more people we have. And I think that's a great loss. Um, so one thing I would absolutely love to see, and again, this is something that could tie into EA grants, perhaps, is having more people um, writing up those ideas that seem really good, um, and including things that we might think of as just you know, well-known within the EA community. Um, I think as well, in terms of choosing media, we should also be thinking a lot about how we are communicating about effective altruism. Um, I've definitely been thinking about social media a lot, and I'm not so sure that like, it's even possible to like, do effective altruism really well on mainstream social media channels where the thing is they're just like optimized for trying to create drama or trying to kind of simplify. I mean, I'm trying to imagine like Francis Bacon trying to explain to people the scientific method on Twitter. <laughs> and he just gets 20 people responding, calling him a cuck. Like, um, I mean, it's just not, it's just like not really going to work. Um, um, and so, yeah, I only learned that word like after going on the Joe Rogan podcast. And, uh, <laughs> if anyone wants to advise me about which media to go on, I can, uh, <laughs> I can clear, clearly benefit from that. Um, uh, but yeah, so I do think like maybe it's just the case that we should accept that like the incentives of Facebook and Twitter are just very different from the ones that we have, um, and instead it's things like podcasts or like long form. Um, discussion, like long-form blog posts or discussions, are just like much better a way of actually being able to communicate um, and discuss the ideas that um, we want to discuss and in the way that we want to discuss them. Um, and then the final one is just, you know, as we grow, inevitably there's kind of greater risk of kind of dilution of these ideas. And like I do personally think that we're really onto something that's kind of good, kind of big, and could be much, much larger than it is now. Um, that it could be the case that you know, just everyone, for any decision that really impacts the world, they're just thinking about, well, what does the evidence say? What do the best arguments say? Being open to the different possible answers and asking all of those questions in the pursuit of saying, well, of the actions I can choose, which are the ones that are going to help other people as much as possible? Um, and remarkably, that seems to be not how much of the world operates. And as we grow, it's obviously a risk that that kind of core idea would be diluted. And so one thing we did to try and um, kind of counteract against that is uh, set up a kind of what CEA, like we started to survey different, organiza different organizations and people in EA to try and come up with a definition of effective altruism, because um, remarkably there really wasn't one before, um, and a set of values that we think kind of really embody this. Um, and that's kind of listed on the next um, page. It's really hard to do this well, because you need to have a kind of balance between not being so specific that no one actually agrees with the technical definition, and also 
not being so broad that it's just completely empty. And so these are the definitions we came up with. Effective altruism is about using evidence and reason to figure out how to benefit others by as much as possible and taking action on that basis. And then the effective altruism community are people who are um, benefiting others and making that a significant part of their lives and taking action, um, uh, taking action to do so in a kind of significant way. Um, and then I think even more importantly within the values um, that we kind of outlined. And I'll explain these in a second, but this is something that a lot of people then got on board with, a number of different organizations kind of signed on. And I think this hopefully could help a lot because it means that we can have a shared understanding and a shared vocabulary by which we can say, okay, well, this is actually what we're standing for. Um, and it means that you know, people who are then external looking on what we're doing won't just will perhaps have a better, more nuanced understanding of what we're actually trying to achieve, rather than just thinking that we think that everyone ought to earn to give in finance in order to fund randomized control back charities or something, which is the kind of simplistic view that's very common. And so these principles where one is just a commitment to others, um, where you know, many people in the effect of the community, one of the things we're really distinctive is often just the level of moral seriousness that we have. Um, obviously, it, it's up to each person to figure out, you know, what is the way of implementing effective altruism that's um, going to be best for you or fits best with your life. But we're a really weird community insofar as um, it's just so common for people to say, live on minimum wage and donate everything above that or donate 50% of their earnings or really switch their career in order to try and do as much good. That's perhaps not for everyone, but it's a... Uh, definitely something that's kind of usual within this community. And then secondly, where we get the bite is really then a, taking a scientific mindset to this, where that means you know, being willing to talk in terms of degrees of belief, being willing to change your mind in the light of new evidence, being open to kind of unusual ideas as well, and then wherever possible, subjecting these to an actual test. And then um, somewhat relatedly is the idea of openness as well, both with respect to causes, so in principle being open to any way of making the world better. That might be through improving animal, animal welfare, through benefiting the long-term future, benefiting people today, and also through methods as well, not being set on saying, look, as many people in the charity sector are, by saying, what I really care about is football, and so I'm going to figure out how I can benefit um, people in poverty using football, but instead just being open to all sorts of different um, methodolo methodologies or pathways to doing good. And then the last two, I think, are kind of in, built in there because this is now a we question rather than just an I question. So the idea of acting with integrity, of ensuring that you know, we're honest and trustworthy and have the same kind of high epistemic standards um, that we're trying to promote in general and that we don't do things that, like, harming people for the greater good, or things that others would find morally dubious. And similarly, that we have a collaborative spirit, um, that even when we have people with whom we have big disagreements, if they're also aiming to really try and improve the world, working together with them, and trying to think, OK, what are the gains from trade that we can have? How can we work together, even if we have somewhat different pictures of the world? And so one of the things I really hope is that these set of values can really become part of the vocabulary when we talk about effective altruism and that when we think of ourselves as, you know, talking about these ideas in the public sphere, we kind of think of ourselves as ambassadors for these ideas, not merely just people who are suggesting things, but also representing um, a broader kind of worldview. And I think it's just by um, doing that and by living up to many of these values that's the way that we're going to be able to do the most good as a community. Okay, thank you, and I'll move on to Nathan.